Good afternoon. You're very brave to stay till the bitter end, but it'll be worth it, I assure you. Just some uh, housekeeping first. Please take your cell phones and pagers and put them on. Uh, I prefer actually to turn them off, but if you must, put them on vibrate, please. If there is an unfortunate incident which requires evacuation, it's a very strategically located room. The exit to the street, right straight out the, those doors. Also, don't forget to scan in your your badge in order to get uh, your PDH or CEU credits. My name is Ted Shepard. I'm vice president of the DeRoss Group. I am a consultant of the fabricated steel construction industry, and I've known Bill for a long time. Unfortunately, he plans on telling you how long. I. Uh, my theory is uh, age is a number and mine is unlisted. The uh, bill has presented to this conference uh, on many, many occasions. He's also conducted seminars for AISC throughout the country. And he's an expert on connection design. And today he's going to talk about load path and transfer forces and the apparent lack of joint equilibrium. And I'd like to introduce my friend, Bill Merrill. Thank you. Thank you. I've had the uh, dubious distinction of speaking to the last session a couple times. And really, I don't really like to do it because I think it's the wrong group. The people that stay to the end generally know what I'm going to say. It's the people that went home early, maybe. They're, maybe follow that kind of a model and taking some shortcuts with their work. So, But thanks for staying. Today's topic is dealing with load path transfer forces and apparent lack of joint equilibrium. Now this is something that we see all the time. I My practice for the past 20 years has been uh, devoted to connection design, so maybe I see it more than some of you. I see 40 or 50 jobs a year and to keep my talk current today, I, I, I waited for projects that would be good examples to use, and one came in just maybe five or six weeks ago. That's going to be the last example we show. So the, the talk is fairly current with examples. If you're anything like me, as you travel around the country, you look at buildings, and there's one thing on your mind, load path, you're trying to figure out how it works. That's why I became a structural engineer. I, I grew up just miles from the George Washington Bridge, thinking, if people know how to do that, that's what I want to learn how to do. And as you look at buildings and innovative connections, maybe you're thinking about transfer force mechanisms or innovation. And as you're looking at buildings, maybe you're wondering if the owner had a big budget. Maybe you'd like to review the design calcs. There's some really interesting stuff happening nowadays. This is a building that I worked on. If I hadn't, when I drove by here, I'd want to take the skin off, take a look at the diagrid, try to picture how it worked, what would be needed for connections, what kind of problems the erector would have. If you look very carefully, you can see some false work. If I can find my pointer. Can you see the false work? holding up the cantilever. That's a piece of false work, actually. The main building columns back there. Well, I've been in the business 43 years, and Ted was one of my first bosses. He, he was a very young at the time. He was a very young boss. But he was there before me. We started with the sixth edition. I think it cost $7 for the sixth edition. The company gave them to us. Nowadays, maybe, you're, maybe you have to buy your own for $350, or if you're a member, for $175. We had Smoleys. Anybody remember Smoleys? And log tables. In case you had really hard problems, you could use logs. We used slide rules for calculations. We never trusted the results. We did the numbers twice. 
Sometimes we struggled with the decimal point. We didn't use them for straight edges. We had comptometers for adding up dead load accumulations. You can find those in antique shops. Eventually, we were issued HP 35s, the electronic slide rule. They were given to us with the warning, don't believe the results. This is true. I mean, anybody, was anybody here in that era where you got your first calculator and you didn't really trust it? We were told not to trust it. And, and in fact, we didn't trust it, so we would do the numbers twice and get two different answers because we didn't do the numbers right. Finally, we got modern, the Trash 80. It's portable. Anyone have one? I think it weighed 38 pounds. So it was good for a physical. We were told, don't believe the output. I worked for a big company then. We had a uh, quality assurance group who said, you're going to need to develop a verification run so that every time you turn this machine on, you'll process the same problem and see if you get the same answers. I mean, that was the state of belief in the technology. We've come a long way from that. And along the way, we had access to our corporate mainframe computer, which was really handy. As we had the early analytical program, Stress. Remember Stress? Stress was stressful to use. It was limited in size, joints, and members. We used to do the upper half of the building, get the reactions, turn them upside down, put them on the lower half, and, model, and then analyze the lower half. Totally forget about any strain compatibility issues, like drift. We had scheduled 3 a.m. CPU time because we were the engineering department and the business activities were more important, which meant that we would have the, the output mailed to us the next day. So two days later, you had your answers. We also had strudel, the early strudel. Two days later, after waiting and waiting, you might find you had a fatal error. So you would correct something and re redo it. This is the way it was. We made drawings by hand. Everybody was issued a brush. We had no idea that someday an isometric would be a side product of detailing software using wireframe methods. We've come a long ways. Your new engineers are pretty well equipped. Some of them even have access from their home to your company network so that they can work from home. Today's methods, 3D modeling, thousands of nodes perhaps and members, hundreds of load cases, computer analysis producing member forces and deflections. The computer even sizes the members, makes all the code checks. And I think if we were to take a vote, a lot of you would say that the work of these analytical programs today is, is very credible. You don't really doubt the results unless you haven't used a proper modeling technique. The computers even do some type of connection designs. If you talk to the people out here before they left, you'd see that some of the programs have fairly good connection design routines for this, the more simple types of connections. Verification of the computer analysis is based on not checking the output to see if it's what you expected, but checking the model, checking the loads, reviewing the drift. At this point, with the, with the computer having selected your sizes, you're feeling pretty good that you're just about finished. There's no mention in the verification that you've done some confirmation that the load paths were what you anticipated. And no mention that the load paths were reasonable. And no mention of identifying critical points of load transfer. By the way, if you want to raise your hand if you disagree with something, Ted will take care of you. <laughs> There's no mention of possibly post-processing the output to calculate transfer forces, which is a fairly trivial mathematical task. 
And by the way, it's a task that none of the computer software vendors that I, that I know of do. I approached a couple of the vendors here this, this week, and I asked, do you cal calculate transfer forces? I tried to phrase it differently. Do you have a calculation force post-processor? Sounded more like I knew what I meant. And all of them said, what do you mean by transfer force? So that was a fairly big tip-off that they didn't have that capability. The transfer forces are what you need to design the connections, certain connections. They're also what you need to check the shop drawings. When the detailer finally gets finished, you've answered all his RFIs, you finally get shop drawings, you've got difficult connections, you might have to go back into your output at that point to get the transfer forces to see if what he's got on the page is correct. So it's one of those do it now or do it later things. There's no mention of believing the computer output. To borrow a very cliched word from the 90s, the greatest segue over the span of my career from the practice of not believing the results of the latest computing devices, like the HP 35, without some post-processing activities, such as double check, to the practice of believing that the results of the latest analytical software do not require some post-processing activities. That when you're done, you're done. We've made great progress, but there are a few things that the structural engineer can still do to assist the fabricator with his work in making sure that you've got adequate connections. And that's, that's really what this industry is all about. If a building didn't have any connections, the steel mill would just ship all the steel right to the site. And the, what would the erector do, Ted? Send it back. Send it back. It needs connections. And there are a few things that the fabricator's connection design engineer can do to ensure the development of adequate connections. And this session is going to be about that. We'll talk about those things. There's a lot to go through, so I'll try to move through it fairly quickly so you can get out of here by... Six? Is it six? Seven thirty. There's the title. A subtitle would be What Loads Are Needed for Connection Design. Another subtitle might be Can Connections Be Designed If Joint Is Not in Equilibrium? Remember your early steel design courses? They said when you design a connection, make a scale drawing, put on all the concurrent loads so the joint's in equilibrium and then work your way through the plies of the connection. Now that's a little difficult to do when you've had 250 load cases and all of the members coming into a given joint might have been governed by a different load case. So your envelope forces are, would hopelessly be out of equilibrium, particularly when you have signed forces, the largest tension and the largest compression for each member. So we'll try to deal with that a bit. But the subtitle would be, Can Adequate Connections Be Designed If Joint Is Not In Equilibrium? And that actually is what the practice has been. Most of our joints are not in equilibrium, and we figure out what to do with them. So moving ahead, we'll be posing some rhetorical questions along the way, like, if in the moment frame structural systems, the structural engineer record routinely checks the column panel zone shear, how many of you are SERs, uh, engineers of record? Do you check panel zone shear? That's, I didn't see those hands. Did, did some of you check panel zone shear? Do you get it out of your computer analysis? Will you do it yourself? Yes and, yes and not sure. But if they check panel zone shear routinely, and a lot of other SCRs have told me that they do, as required by the code of standard practice, then why in a brace frame structural system does the engine not provide, engineer record not provide critical load transfer forces as required by the code of standard practice? I find a lot of people will check the columns to see if you need web doublers. They might even adjust the column size to eliminate the web doubler. But I see very few people. In fact, the, there's only one industry that routinely provides transfer forces, and that's the power industry where they're working predominantly in pin-connected, uh, non-composite floor structures. Now, here the topic we're going to look at, 
simple knee brace, overstressing of supporting members at stadium raker connections, significance of working with concurrent forces, consideration of out of plane vertical forces in brace frame systems. Paddle zone shear and exercise and transfer forces. Load path considerations in tension only vertical bracing systems. Case for structural engineer of record review of brace frame output. Not that he shouldn't always do it. Algorithms addressing adequate design of out of equilibrium joints. And then we're going to zoom in on one of the connections in this structure. And we'll look at reconciling out of equilibrium, equilibrium unusual, unusually poor load path and high transfer force joint through the use of redundancy. That's not a master's thesis. Now, starting with the knee brace. This is a the very simple knee brace. This is something that you might have uh, taken a look at in your first structural engineering course. You've got a diagonal brace. Some people call them kickers. You've got a beam. This is what you see on the design drawings. If you're a connection engineer like me, this is what you see. You might have to go to the plan drawing to get the beam size. A section would be cut showing the brace size. Almost always, the, adic the uh, axial load in the brace is shown. But the knee brace beam very rarely is a tension load shown in that beam. You know, that, that's just the pure, simple statics of this. So you've got insufficient data to design the beam to column connection. So what does the detailer do at this point? Do we have any detailers here? A couple detailers. Maybe some of you detailers use uh, programs like SDS2 that does connection design. You can get these off your model. Uh, you model, you can go right in there and do this. You might be tempted to model this. If no axial load were shown in the beam, you might be tempted to model that using the specified shear maybe something like 50% UDL, which would really not be a very prudent way to approach this, but that is something that you might do, in which case you'd get a bad connection of the beam to the column because there would be no consideration of axial load. If it happened to work, it would be coincidence. This session was given yesterday, and after the session, a man approached me and said he had the same problem if the beam wasn't a W8, it was a W24, and the kicker didn't have 36 kips, it had 160-some kips, and all of these connections were designed for shear, and they had to go back and retrofit the appropriate connection in the field to get these fixed. So this is not something I just dreamed up, this is a, this is a real situation. Now if the spec requires a, a, a connection design engineer, and for the sake of today, I'm going to call that person a CPE. That would be the connection PE. Like CPA, they account for forces. CPAs account for dollars. Connection engineer accounts for forces. If you had a CPE on the job, he would immediately notify that the beam needed an axial load. He probably wouldn't even write an RFI. He would just calculate the axial load, design the connection for it. Now, but in a larger sense, should anybody expect the fabricator's PE, the CPE, to identify beams with missing axial loads? What do you think? I know what your attorney would say. He would say, my attorney. He would say, you shouldn't find any beams with missing axial loads because then they'll be expected, it'll be expected that you find all the beams with missing axial loads, and when one is missed, it'll be your fault. So you've got to be careful what you do. That's really not in your scope. How far should the CPE go with identifying beams with missing axial loads? Should he take this axial load, apply it to the column, and assume that the column is taking it as a flexural? If it's mid-span, that would be applicable. Should he analyze the column to see if it can take a load like that to double-check the engineer? See, we're, we're getting a field here. 
if, there, if this is a floor level and there's a beam back here, should he put this axial load in this axial, in that beam as an axial load, and try to trace it to some point of vertical bracing? If this were 162 kips, you might have 100 kips here. You really need to search for a path for 100 kips. If this is 24 kips, maybe not. But should your fabricator's engineer, whose only scope really is to design the connection, should he be doing this kind of post-analytical work on the structure? Isn't that really the engineer's role? Now, if this goes to the SER on a shop sheet, and this connection is flawed, the SER will probably find it, right? Yeah, I said that yesterday where the, all the, the room wasn't quite this big. So I could see people a lot better. And a lot of people looked down to see if their shoes were tied. And one engineer called out, like someone over here, no, we're not going to find that. That's, this is a small appendage in what might be a package of hundreds of shop sheets. But if he did find it, the detailer would just make the changes without charge, right, you detailers? You would just scrub your drawings and fix that, right? But is that the proper protocol when the SER's analysis already has the beam axial load? It's in the model, assuming this was modeled. This might have been a last minute appendage. But assuming it was in the model, he's got that axial load. Why didn't it appear on the drawing? So for some opinions and recommendations, the CPE should not be required to identify beams with missing axial loads. I don't, I don't feel. By the way, you can feel free to disagree. The CPE's due diligence, however, should be sufficient to qualitatively identify where it looks like beams need to have axial loads. And the SER should be required to show all pertinent uh, axial loads as required by Code of Standard Practice Section 3.1.2. SER should be required to provide transfer loads. In this case, the axial load is the load that transfers into the column. We'll see later today that, that just because it's an axial load doesn't mean it's a transfer load. We'll get to that. Moving to the next category, overstressing of collateral members, and my example here pertains to, to a stadium, but this would apply to any kind of a structure. Here's what shows on the, uh, the design drawings. We have a raker. It frames through a joint. We have some beams. We have a column. The specification on the job showed that the raker, in fact, the specification said all members are to be connected for their full strength. So what does that mean? Does that mean they're to be connected for their full shear strength? Does that mean they're to be connected for their uniform design load capacity? These rakers support precast seats in this case. Does that mean there's a combination of flexural and axial? Does that mean there's some minor axis bending, there's some torsion? You now, what does full strength mean? If it's fully loaded in a flexure, there isn't much strength left for axial. And if it's fully loaded in an axial, you, pr you probably can't put any precast seats on it. So there's a problem with the spec there. So the engineer, the construction engineer, requested the loads from the, uh, and received them, from the engineer of record, and it turns out that this raker had 800 kip axial load, quite by surprise, because the fabricator, in this case, hadn't recently done a stadium to see that maybe the rakers participate in the lateral load resisting system. So there was a big problem, and when you think about this 800 kips needing to go from here to here, unless you put some kind of a massive plate through the column web, and this is what the computer vendors think you're going to do. They think this is a node. This big raker comes in, 
so there's just something sticking off the node. You connect a raker to it for 800 kips. And then down here on the node, you have another thing that matches it. And you have another little piece here that the beam connects to. Well, you can imagine for 800 kips, there's a bit of a gusset in here. And the long and the short of it was that there was collateral damage. This, this region of this beam was severely overstressed. In fact, about a third of the beam was cut away and a larger size 24 was put in as an alternate to putting extensive web doubling plates, mandating major reinforcement. So this raises some questions. Should the engineer of record consider the load path of the raker and the transfer forces when designing the piece? Now, you immediately you see the problem with that because where was this piece designed? In the computer, most likely. This was part of the model. The computer sized the member. The computer thinks the member goes into a node. There's no consideration of what that connection force might, uh, what the consequences of that actual load path through the connection might be. Or from the structural engineer's point of view, should the fabricator have anticipated the rakers would have large, though unshown, axial loads? Now, one of the things I think should have happened here, the SER should have shown the raker forces rather than specifying the raker developed the full strength. The SER should have shown a typical raker connection detail, and if he didn't want to get into connection design, the engineer record could have said web reinforcing as needed. So this would have been a big red flag. Going back to that drawing, picture that raker with no load. If it had 800 kip load on it, perhaps the fabricator, when he was preparing his bid, would have called an engineer in to give a preliminary view of what that connection should look like, which is the next recommendation that fabricators do that. Stay out of trouble at the bid stage unless you want to go to the litigation stage later to recover the money. Now let's move to significance of working with concurrent forces in braced frames. Definition of load path, path followed by the loads from application to support. Very simple concept. Transfer forces, transfer forces transferring from one side of the connection to the other. So if someone was pulling my arm, someone would pull this way, and all that force would have to go right through me. So we would hope it wouldn't be too much. Now here's a, here's a structure that, uh, this is not a real structure. An architect friend of mine told me this was what it should look like. The structural engineer uh, probably negotiated really hard with the architect to put in some bracing. Now, here are the gravity loads. I put some unit gravity loads on, and you can start to actually feel the load path, can't you? Gravity loads come down. Gravity loads are going down. Only trouble here is we have these wings, these cantilever wings. So over here, we've got a hanging column. So this one kip load comes up, meets this load. Now we have two kips here. That becomes the vertical component of the brace. Assuming all these are 45 degrees, that creates a two-kip push in this beam. Now, this beam has zero kips of axial load under dead load, but the transfer force here is going to need to be the horizontal component of the brace. So here's an example of a beam with a zero-kip axial load, yet it has a transfer load. Up here, we have a two-kip axial load in the beam, which becomes the transfer load into the center bay. Over here, we have kind of the reverse, but similar. One kip in the column, joining one kip as two kips, putting the brace in tension, giving us a two kip force in this direction in another beam that has a zero kip axial load. So if you're thinking that you've got all the transfer loads covered, if you have listed the axial loads in the beam, you can put that to rest because here is a case where you don't have that. A 
Uh, here's the wind loads. Simple wind load application. All the wind loads coming down in a tension-only system. Do you people use tension-only systems? Sometimes. For those of you who don't use them, maybe aren't familiar with them, that's a system where the braces only act in tension. So if you had another brace here, it would, it would be inactive in this uh, analytical case. And actually in a field, it would bow into some kind of a, of a first mode configuration. So you can feel the shear loads coming down. Here, now this structure uh, for point of discussion would be uh, a non-composite building. Maybe it's got grading floors. Everything needs to be pin connected and connected together. Here we've got this five kip load becomes a transfer load into the beam. This five kip load becomes a transfer load. Now these are true of all external loads. Over here, same thing. Now take a look at this beam. This has a five kip axial load in the beam. The beam in the next bay has a 25 kip axial load because the shear has been coming down. So what's the transfer load at this point? Five kips. So the, so the axial load in this beam is the transfer load but the axial load in this beam is not the transfer load. This is something a lot of detailers using programs like SDS2 and others, they would model in the 25 kips. The engineer record would see this and be very happy with it. It's way more than is needed. But it's also way more than the fabricator needs to produce. So it's important to be using the, the correct transfer loads. Now if you line the two of these up, you can see what the sum you can do a sum of gravity and vertical in your head and you can see that because of some of the signs of the loads we're going to get a case where dead load and wind load gives us a smaller number in some cases than the dead load or the wind load. This is where your force envelope comes into play. Now, I'm not going to focus on that too much but an overview of this, the axial load equals the transfer load if no bracing is involved at the node. And that would be no bracing in this beam on its side of the column. This beam has bracing on its side of the column. And in that case, the axial load may or may not be the transfer load. Points of note, axial loads are not always transfer forces. Axial loads are transfer forces when the bay containing load does not include vertical bracing, unless there's a horizontal brace. Now, if this were a three bay wide structure, let me go back to that structure. If this were a three bay wide structure and there were a horizontal truss connecting the bay A and bay B and bay C with a horizontal truss so that the wind loads would come across that horizontal truss to load the end trusses where the vertical bracing is, now you would have to add the horizontal component of the brace to your forces to see what the transfer may need to do. Here's an example of that. Here's the elevation. We have a beam with a five kip axial load, which will be the transfer load because there's no brace on this bay. Until we see that there's horizontal bracing here. So, if, And this horizontal bracing is a little problematic because horizontal bracing is always, almost always marked tension compression. So you would take the tension load here. The horizontal component of that would be three kips, just say, you would add that to five and you'd get an eight kip transfer force. So you need to look at the out of plane numbers as well. Opinions and recommendations, the accurate transfer forces can only be determined from concurrent loads. You need to know what's happening at the time that you're making the connection. Transfer forces have profound effect on the connection design and I think the SER should be expected to provide all of the transfer forces. And why don't they routinely do that? I 
Okay. It's yeah. I, I, do you, do you feel that you're getting paid to do that? Provide the transfer force in the back. Now there's one opinion and there's another opinion. There are probably several more. Uh, I don't know if you could all hear that. Uh, would you mind sticking around at the end a little bit? You can, you can mention that to anyone that might come by. But this is, this is not just a simple thing. The engineers have been doing practice with computer models for quite a long time. The engineers have their feeling of when they're done with their work. Uh, lots of us in the connection design business feel that we're not getting sufficient data. I happen to have worked uh, for a number of years, 13 or 14 years, in the design industry. I worked 10 years for Fabricator, 13, 14 years in the design industry doing analyses, and then I've been a connection design specialist since then, so I kind of worked on both sides. But most people that I uh, collaborate with on projects, structural engineers of record, they really don't feel they're getting paid to do the transfer forces. They even object a little bit when I ask for the numbers. Uh, sometimes they offer you the STAD output. On a big job, that's really not a practical way to, to, to do it, as, as we'll see in a little bit. I've got a slide on that. Here's a response I got from some industry experts, because transfer forces are not calculated in the program. How can we give them something that doesn't come out of the computer? It's actually... Uh, not a bad response. A lot of people think the computer gives you everything you need. On the other side of it, we see things that the computer doesn't give that we do need. That's why we're here. Because vendors are not aware of the full needs of their software users. I got this yesterday from a software vendor. I sat down and I explained the dilemma is the first question was, what's a transfer force? 45 minutes later, he understood what a transfer force was. He even took my card, so you'll probably see his software doing it real soon. But he agreed to look into it. Now let's move to a consideration of an out of vertical plane forces in a brace frame. This is a very interesting project that crossed my desk a couple months ago. We have a we have a suspended bay. This is a building column crane column. This is the crane girder. And there's an outboard bay here that is suspended. So its gravity loads kick back to the main building column through these diagonal members. Very interesting topology. It's an out of plane vertical truss along here. This is a two bay wide structure. In the center bay, they can't have horizontal trusses to take the wind load on the end wall. So they have trussed vertically the loads back and these vertical trusses also truss the wind loads to a horizontal truss here and a horizontal truss here. I believe that's the layout. There's at least a horizontal truss here. Now, if you look at this purlin, and we'll go up there and zoom in on this, this purlin is listed with no axial load. And in fact, it doesn't have an axial load, but it's got a major transfer load. And the X component, X direction component of the brace plus the X component of the horizontal bracing in the plane of the roof. 
So if you were the detailer modeling the joint, seeing no axial load in the purlin, you might be tempted to model this with no axial load in the purlin. If you were using SDS2, which most of the programs are, SDS2 would say, we have a missing component here, so we'll assume that that's the transfer force, and conveniently, this joint would be okay with that, provided that that missing component was the sum of this component plus the horizontal brace. Now we added these components. It's, it's, very, it's highly likely that the gravity load in this brace is concurrent with the wind load in that brace. So we don't have any trouble postulating this load case and thinking it's reasonable without even going to the engineer of record to see if he would concur with that. Now, is it acceptable for the CPE to calculate transfer forces in cases with simple topology? And I say, yes, it is. In fact, you, if there were, are there any fabricators here? If your fabricators expect your connection engineers to do that, I, I think that's reasonable. They should in cases of simple topology. But the SER should provide the transfer forces for cases with complex topology and loading. That's a theme. Now, who should look at panel zone shear? Here's a brace frame structure. You can feel the, the load path. The loads, lateral loads are applied and they come to the ground. Some things really are fairly fundamental. Let's say every joint in here is a, is a moment connection. Here's what you need to do to check the panel zone shear. And this picture, by the way, is right out of the 13th edition. You need signed moments for the moment on this beam and the moment on this beam. And you can see that this moment would be the combination of wind and dead load. The dead load moment would be in the other direction, somewhat offset then by the wind load moment. Plus you also need the story shear. So the people that are really equipped to do this panel zone shear calculation are the people who have access to the computer program who know the concurrent case for MU2 and MU1 along with the story shear. Now the design drawing routinely just shows that the beam to column moment connection should be the capacity of the member. This would, this would presuppose that you're going to use a CJP flange welds connect the member to the column, which is the common way of doing this. And that MU2 would be the moment capacity of the member. And it's extremely rare that you see a story shear on the design drawing. That's something that just, does any of, do any of you uh, routinely show the story shears on your design drawings? Those of you who do not do the panel zone shear calc? There was, there was one hand in the back. So what do you do at this point? Approach number one, where you have no story shear, and you're going to take the moments at MN, which is the capacity, you could ask the SER if web doubler plates are needed. This, this is really a good thing to do. As frequently, you'll get the answer back, we've checked it, you don't need to worry about it. Approach number two, you have no story shear, but maybe they gave you signed moments. Maybe they did show you moments. So you can use the minimum of the algebraic sum of MU2 plus MU1 or twice the column capacity for purpose of figuring the panel zone shear. Now you're still stuck without a story shear. So your calculation is going to be liberal with respect to whether or not you need a doubler. So that you'll make yourself Possibly make yourself a hero with your fabricator client, but maybe not. Here's what's needed. This is what's commonly done by people who think they're checking the panel zone shear, but actually you're not getting a good answer. They take the capacity of the beam on the left and the capacity of the beam on the right, and they apply them in these opposite directions. If these are same size beams, 
That means these shears will cancel out. And you have no story shear, so you'll need no web doubler plate. And now you are a hero with your client, the fabricator, except maybe you didn't do it right. So the SCR should comply with the code of standard practice and identify web doubler plate locations. And the CPE should only evaluate panel zone shear if all concurrent force data is available. And some people take a hard line on this and don't do the calc and say, you are responsible for it, Mr. Engineer Record, unless you give me the data, enough data, so that I can check it. A rhetorical question here is, if the SCR has checked the panel zone shear in compliance with 3.1.1, code of standard practice, why don't they provide the transfer forces in compliance with 3.1.2? Now let's go to load path influences and tension only systems. Here's a tension only system, and we talked previously about what that is. The load path is going to be like this to the ground. That's your active system. Your design drawing will look like this. Or rather, to put some numbers on this, if each brace picks up two kips of axial load per one kip of applied load, as you come down the buildings, the brace will have two, four, six, eight, ten kips. Your design drawing will look like this, showing X's. There's the joint that the fabricator's detailer will see. Here's the load path. Your detailers might start to see where this is going. If you're designing with the design force method, which most of your software would not be doing, that's, that's an older method. The AISC has endorsed the uniform force method. This method, the direct force method, uses a force and a moment at the gusset to column and beam connections, and there's no participa participation of the beam to column connection in the vertical brace connection. So if you happen to be using software or calculations using the direct force method, it doesn't matter how you model this in your connection design software, you'll get the correct answer. If you're using the uniform force method, this method is a little more complex. This is the method that is endorsed by the AISC. It gives a little more uh, economical connections, uses shear components and a transverse component at each uh, edge of the gusset, and this component adds to the beam reaction. So the beam to column connection participates in the brace connection. So if you have this modeled tension, tension, and these are Sometimes you'll see that the braces are given all the same axial load. It's possible that those extra components, which are supposed to add to the beam reaction, will cancel out. So you will not be getting a valid answer. This is particularly true for you guys using uh, SDS2 to get your connections. You need to really watch for this in a tension-only system. And what you need to do is model this with the upper brace and tension coming across here. This is the load path coming down here with the lower brace here inactive, not modeled, with the upper brace here not modeled. Or another condition would be the upper brace in tension, the lower brace inactive. This is when the loads reverse. The load coming across and lower brace in tension, the upper brace inactive. So you need to go through those permutations or make sure that your software is doing that in order to get the correct vertical brace calculations. If you engineers are record checking the calculations, you'll need to make sure that, that, that this is the way they did it. So in the tension only bracing system, if your connection engineer is using direct force method, and I use direct force method quite a bit because of the lack of transfer forces. Beam column connections are OK. If you're using the uniform force method, you have to be careful how you get your answers. Now, a similar thing happens in tension compression systems, where this is your joint, 
you need to model the plus with a minus. And a minus with a plus. That's the way the system, that's the load flow. So you have to watch out for that. Now this is a case of a job I worked on many years ago. So this, I, I have one really current one, a couple of current ones. This one goes back a ways, but it's such a good example of why the engineer of record needs to look at his output. This is the front engine, this, and this is a, was a real project uh, in the power industry. Here's a small building, six 20-foot tall bays, or six 20-foot high levels, rather, three 20-foot wide bays, fairly heavily braced. We call this the yardstick building because it was so slender. It was only 20 feet wide. Because it was only 20 feet wide, we didn't think it would be stiff enough to take the wind loads, so we tied it to an adjacent structure, which was a massive structure. And the plan was just to take those lateral wind loads right into the adjacent structure. Now, wouldn't you know it, right before we went to bids, the owner called and said, uh, this column is in a driveway access road. This is true. You've got to take it out. Well, this was modeled on strudel. This was really easy to take this member out. The analyst just made it inactive. He also put in, so their column's missing now. He also put in some bracing here to help carry the heavy vertical load back up the structure. Turned out to be something of a fatal move. He also put in some extra vertical bracing in the front face. This structure had very heavy gravity loads. You know, and gravity loads really like to go straight down. Now it can't do that. It's got to come up in some manner. There's his final structure. The ties participated in the gravity load resisting system. Now that, that actually stirred quite a controversy. The engineer record hadn't noticed, by the way, this is the guy that worked for me. <laughs> so I didn't notice either. But uh, there's no excuse for that. Back in those days, as today, we had the results of a strudel analysis. We, we all tended to believe them. We didn't do too much looking. But the unloaded, tended load path wasn't followed, the wind ties had to load. This is how it was done. Now my company was a very large company. We had an in-house quality team. They stumbled onto this and got very upset about it. And it was happening during the bid phase. And this was for a, a large, major, very large utility client who didn't like changes. They don't like to change things. They think when you're finished with your work, it's got to stand. So the project manager said, why should we change it? It works. It must work because Strudel says it works, right? It would have worked. The engineer's review team said, violates the design intent, the ties resist lateral load only, the design must be revised. Now, why did it happen? Was there a problem? Is there an ethical issue? Why did it happen? Engineer didn't check his output. Computer model was not in concert with the design intent. The ties should have been inactive. It would have been a very simple test to make the ties inactive for the gravity case. Computer output, the design was not in concert with the design intent. The ties should not have carried gravity load. Was there really a problem? The engineer's PM said, no, it works. But the review team said it's unsafe as designed because if, if the owner decides to take those ties out on a calm day, and they had already been labeled on a design drawing as wind ties. So if it's not windy, you shouldn't need them. And that would be uh, cause an unsafe redistribution of the gravity loads and the design team prevailed and the design was changed. When those gravity loads redistribute, they probably never would have gotten the ties back in place anyway. As a pertinent rhetorical question, 
Is there an ethical obligation for the engineer record or the SER to review the computer output? Is this an ethical obligation? You know, we all know the ethics of our practice as engineers. When we all got licensed in all our different states, we signed off on the fact that we had read the ethics. So is there an ethical issue here? Is there an ethical issue to be aware of all the final load paths? Did you notice? That was a rhetorical question. So if you've got some answers, we can talk about them if, if we still have time. Now here's a uh, complex building. This is a, this is a job I like to talk about. I've used it in a couple speeches. And my friend Rick out here sent me this nice picture. So uh, if you have any real questions about this building, you can ask Rick Forrest if he doesn't escape after the job. This is a very large model. Six, plus or minus 6,000 nodes, plus or minus 4,000 members, 250 load cases. It's a, a fairly large airplane hangar. It's a maintenance hangar. So you've got things that hang from the trusses. The SER did a nice job of showing on the bid drawings the force envelopes. So we knew all the forces and all the members, plus and minus. No transfer forces were included. Now the SER either needs to calculate the transfer forces and the analytical, once again, the analytical programs don't do it and didn't do it at the time, or facilitate development of a transfer force algorithm, which is a topic that came out of the kickoff meeting for the job, to determine reasonable transfer forces. So we did that. We worked jointly on that, no pun intended. Now here's a typical joint that we use. This, this happens not to be a photograph from the same project, but it's a similar joint. You can see you have a sway frame on the left side. There's also a sway frame on the right side. There's the diagonal member. The right side also has a two angle strut and two diagonal members in a horizontal plane, forming part of a horizontal truss. And the main truss has a vertical member and two diagonals. And of course, two cords come into the joint. So there were various combinations of this on the project, including the case where this, the sway frame on this side would also be a part of a horizontal truss. So you had 10 or 11 members that might frame into a joint. With 250 load cases, the equilibrium was just way, way off. You, you couldn't do anything with it. By the way, the connection of the sway frame on the far side of the truss is similar to this. There's a vertical plate. So we've got a vertical plate here. The sway frame connects to it. That connects to the gusset and to the horizontal gusset. Now, we developed the, the uh, transfer force algorithm over a, a two-day meeting, a day-and-a-half meeting. It was a fairly uh, uh, painless meeting. We just sat down and reviewed what looked good to both the fabricator, I represented the fabricator, and Rick's engineer represented the engineering effort, the man who did the analysis. We decided that the cord splice would be away from the panel point. Now that really helps a lot. That gives you a nice continuity of the cord right through the joint, and it reduces the overall size of this gusset. Number two, it was decided, and this is where the software vendors are, that all members would be connected to their supporting gussets for their listed forces. That is just implicit. If you have 500 kips in a member and you're connecting that member to something, you need to connect it for 500 kips. That's the easy part. That's implicit. This is what the software people tell you, why they think they're finished because they've given you all those forces, you just need to connect them. Part three of the algorithm, the hanger load, load path, is from the hanger to the hanger gussets, from the hanger gussets to the main gussets, and from the main gussets directly into the trussing diagonals. And those connections don't need anything extra because the axial load and the trussing diagonal all, all, already includes the component of the hanger. Now, the more interesting stuff is part 4A, the sway frame without horizontal trussing. So there's a portion of the algorithm for every permutation of what might happen at the joint. 
connect the vertical transverse trusses to the main gussets for the Y component of the sway frame plus the Y component of the strut. That would be the vertical direction. Plus the Z component of the sway frame and the Z component of the strut. For B, sway framing with horizontal trussing, and I'll just put this up and you can look at this, but this was the way the algorithm was developed to make sure that we captured every layer of the joint. It's a fairly simple algorithm. There was a, this was immediately put on, on uh, Excel when I got back to my office. Then it became a large data entry thing into Excel for all of the typical joints that we had to look at to make sure we had the, the job uh, carefully bracketed from a connection design point of view. Opinions and recommendations on this, that the development of the algorithm was, was really pretty simple. There's, there's nothing that's very high power about this. We're talking basic statics and making sure that we've got everything covered. And making sure that we don't have too much. For instance, if the summation of the transverse forces on this side of the joint is 500, because we've combined two diagonal members in tension with the strut in tension, but the sum of the transverse forces on the other side of the truss is only 150, that we wouldn't design the transfer force as the larger. We took it as the smaller which is all the common sense of the joint. Now, the algorithm didn't result in overly conservative connections. There's no complaint from the fabricator about that. And does anyone really want to save a few bolts in a large truss connection anyway? Now, stiffness versus gravity, a time for redundancy. Here's a current project. This is a 439-foot truss, continuous over a center tower. So this is what this looks like. This looks like a fabricator's dream when you first look at it. All these really heavy members, lots of tonnage. Now take a look at section A. Or rather, first take a look at the top cord plan. Can you see those numbers? Can you read those? Now you're starting to get some surprises when you look up here. You got these little lines. You're thinking, now, what are those little lines? This is the top cord plane of the truss. And look at these numbers. What are these? Where are those big forces coming from? So there's a bit of a mystery going on here. So now, just to get you refreshed, let's look at section A. Here's section A. Now you see the 20-foot box truss sits on a transfer girder in a 50-foot wide bay. And there's some bracing, debracing, from the truss top cord down to the transfer girder level. So now you're thinking, OK, these members probably are taking the wind load. This is 439 feet. There's a lot of wind at the center tower carried through the truss top cord horizontal truss. So we're going to get some wind loading coming down here. Now if you zoom in on, so you can read the forces in section A at the top, now you see some real surprises. 52 kip column loads coming down to the transfer girder. This is where you'd expect the vertical component of the truss end diagonal to be coming down the columns to the transfer girder, wouldn't you? Look at the knee braces. 292 kips. Now look at the sizes. 10 by 49 column, 14 by 90 knee brace. So what's happened here? And look up here, 164 kips. Now, this number actually was out of concert with the number that showed on the plan. So this design went through several iterations of revision. But what's going on here is pretty obvious. This frame offered more stiffness resistance than these columns and picked up disproportionate amount of the gravity load. 
Now, this is really something that you don't like at first. Does anyone like that? I didn't like it. It just didn't seem right. We always thought, take the gravity loads down. Maybe there should have been some releases in the model. under gravity loads to take these braces out of the gravity load picture to make sure we had a nice stiff transfer girder. Maybe in the analysis the transfer, 50 foot transfer girder was too flexible. When these 52 kip loads caused enough deflection on that, the tendency was for the knee braces to pick up the load. This is the kind of thing you get out of your run, perhaps by intent and perhaps not by intent. So the strut across the top is balancing the diagonal compression loads and not shown on here, there's a large tension load in the W30 member. So the, the final analysis of this is that you've got lots of members that have big forces that you wouldn't have had otherwise, which is why I objected to it at first. I didn't mean to say that because now I've given it away. So this does raise the question, is this the engineer record's design intent? And should we follow the engineer's load path or should we do something that we're more comfortable with, like provide a redundant load path, which is a nice thing in a 439 foot truss anyway to have a little bit of redundancy. Let's take a look at joint A. We've got all of those different members coming into joint A. Here are the cord members. You look at the force difference. Here's the, here's the post. Here is the truss and diagonal. And the vertical brace in the center panel of the truss. These forces are all in the same plane. Here are the horizontal forces. Here's the strut coming across. Here is the diagonal member in the horizontal truss of the roof or the top, truss top cord plan, marked as plus or minus. This load was marked as plus or minus. That was an error. That's only a compression load. And here's the, at joint A, here's the knee brace. So now you're starting to get a feel for this. Now you've got all the forces you need. You don't know if these forces are concurrent. They might not be. So any exercise you go through for equilibrium is maybe like watering your rock garden because you don't know if the forces are concurrent. But I went ahead and looked at equilibrium anyway because I thought you should. So here are all the different members that come into the joint. And by the way, joint B, which is the other joint in section A, has one additional member. I took the axial loads that were given, broke them into their X, Y, and Z directions and did some summing, and you can see the out of equilibrium. From 5 to 43, depending on how you take this, 14 kips vertically didn't seem too bad, and from 4 to minus 38, depending how you distributed this. Then you recall that the strut across the top is actually a flexural load also. So you assign 50% UDL, which is the specification. We don't have the actual load there. And now your Y direction out of equilibrium is 62 kips. Now, we structural engineers are using programs like STAD because we want precise results. And within the context of the SAD output or whatever software you're using, you have precise results. You've got all of this numerical accuracy it's all right in there. But yet when you give the information to the detailer, the fabricator and the detailer for a purpose of connection design, you would think you'd want the same kind of precision numerically that you got for your structural analysis in your connection analysis. Yet we don't get that. This is routine. We find stuff like this all the time. So you try to decide what to do with that. And because the loads are not concurrent, the actual lack of equilibrium is, is probably a lot different than this. So what do you do? 
What's a reasonable approach? We provided a redundant load path. Here's what the joint looks like. There's the strut, the, the knee brace. Here's the post. We put a massive node here, kind of emulating the node in the computer. We connected the brace to the node and the strut to the node for the axial load and the gravity load. And we made sure that this node was strong enough in buckling to take the entire gravity load into the post. We checked the post to make sure it could take the entire gravity load. And we rechecked the transfer girder to make sure it could take the gravity load. Now, we went ahead and did that. Here's what it looks like in, in isometric. We took the node plate and fitted it into the cord. And we ran the cord continuously through the joint to a splice to make sure that we didn't have a large axial transfer force right at this node. So we put the transfer force back here. And that way, we didn't need to question what kind of transfer force we should have, it was automatically the force back here. That's the way the joint ended up. At the bottom, the engineer of record, for some reason, wanted the column to stop a foot higher than the top of steel of the 30-inch beam. So we facilitated that. We put a little bracket up here. We bolted the, a base plate for the knee brace to the column cap plate and a top flange plate on the bracket. We transfer the load down into the girder. We have the girder connected for the full vertical component of the brace. And we also have it checked against the transfer girder carrying the full gravity load without participation of the, of the knee brace. Now, there was an interesting twist. We sent this off to the SER for approval. And the SER's project manager rejected it. He said, it doesn't meet the design intent. So that was a little surprising. And I think we did some reading between the lines at that point, And we figured out that he was saying, it doesn't meet what he thinks the design intent should be, that you shouldn't have the need for all of these heavily loaded knee braces. So he rejected this without checking with his engineer in his office who did the design work. So we resubmitted the connection designs with a written letter of explanation of the load path. And this time, he went to the engineer who did the work, who accepted the connections. Now, opinions and recommendations. I did have initial objections. But when you look at the overall isometrics of this, and you keep in mind that this is a 439-foot truss continuous over the tower, these stout knee braces are looking pretty good to me. This, this thing is a football field and another 30 yards. You've got to, so you've got four 14 by 90 members up there making sure it doesn't go out of plane. That's, that's okay with me. So it was a unique load path. It had a lot of heavy forces, but I ended up very happy with it. Now, in closing, just a couple remarks. Now, we live in very uh, technological times. If you looked at some of the displays that were that these vendors are proposing. There's just all kinds of just marvelous analytical stuff that's made available. But we live in a time of ironies. Our structures have been rigorously analyzed with every node achieving perfect force equilibrium, while the connections in our main lateral load system, resisting systems may have been designed without knowledge of concurrent self-equilibrating forces. It just seems ironic that we as an industry would have evolved to that position. And the irony that while the output of our 3D an analyses contains specific actual shear reactions for all beam to beam and beam to column connections, our most common standard of practice is to connect the beams for a percent of their uniform load capacity. It's just a large percentage of the industry that uses 50% UDL for non-composite and some higher factor for composite, when in fact all those actual shears are, are available. And with something like ram steel can be automatically uh, extracted from analysis and put on design drawing. In spite of these ironies 
Adequate connections are routinely designed when the load paths intended by the SER are followed, which means you have to figure them out. You might have to work with the SER to do that. The transfer forces are prudently computed, as we did on the big hangar job, by taking a couple days to figure out how we would do it before we did it. And lack of apparent joint equilibrium is countered by the development of conservative design algorithms and perhaps did the addition of selective redundant load paths. So thanks for your time. And we have a few minutes for questions. Actually, we have all the time in the world for connections because there's nothing else. Oh, okay. Uh, the mics do work. That way, uh, by the way, they are uh, audio recording this, so if you go to a mic, you're going to be on the uh, official version that comes out with the proceedings. Any questions? Everyone want to go home? Thank you.